Well, this tree's definitely seen better days. Beetles have made a big meal of this one. Look at where the saps run out. Each year between June and August, female beetles can be seen scouting out new trees to invade. Usually the trees they like are older, larger diameter trees, drought stressed and perhaps even diseased. These trees are less able to pitch the beetles out with sap. Once they've found a good tree, they start releasing pheromones or chemical signals that tell other beetles where to attack. The beetles converge on the tree and bore through cracks and crevices in the bark to get at the phloem, which is the layer of the tree that carries the nutrients. Once they're inside, they bore tunnels and the females lay their eggs, about 100 or more. The eggs hatch in the fall and the larvae spend the winter munching and snacking on the phloem until the following summer and then the process starts all over again. The new adults will emerge from their tree and fly a short distance, up to about a half mile looking for other trees to invade. However, beetles can get blown by the wind much farther. It's a process that's been going on for thousands of years and most folks never noticed it until now. So, what's different? How did the mountain pine beetle go from a total unknown to a superstar in just a few years? You might say it's the perfect storm. For starters, the weather is changing. Summers have been hotter and winters have been warmer. The deep cold snaps that usually kill off the beetles during the winter just haven't been happening. And the beetles are emerging from their trees earlier each year and attacking new trees later into the summer. To top it off, the park experienced a severe drought starting around 1998. This weakened the trees and made them more vulnerable to attack. And in Rocky Mountain National Park, at least, our forests are older, which also makes them vulnerable. Many of the park's lodgepole pine forests are already affected. Significant numbers of limber pine, spruce, and fir are also being hit. That's a lot of dead trees, and it's a lot of change all at once. So you're probably wondering, how can we stop it? Well, there are only three ways to stop this process. One a nice cold arctic front where temperatures are consistently below zero for at least a week, or two, a giant forest fire that kills all the trees and the beetles, or three, the beetles kill so many trees that they run out of trees to infest and their population crashes. Whoa, wait a minute, back up. The only three ways to stop it are arctic temperatures, giant forest fires, or when the beetles eradicate their own food supply. None of these are things that we can do to stop the epidemic. So no amount of money and nothing we can do is going to stop the epidemic. But we can try to limit it. And that's what Rocky Mountain National Park is trying to do. Rocky Mountain National Park is a national park. And it's our job to preserve natural conditions. And like it or not, the beetles are native and a part of the natural process of forest regeneration. Given the enormity of the beetle outbreak, the park's mitigation efforts will be primarily focused on areas immediately adjacent to roads and buildings. One of our goals is to protect high value trees, such as trees that have significant scenic or historic value, trees that provide screening and shade, and trees that provide important habitat. Another goal is to keep you safe by removing hazardous trees. Park employees are taking action working to mitigate the beetle infestation in this area. We also remove any trees that are already dead and that might pose a danger to people or property. You may see some areas of the park that are temporarily closed due to hazardous trees. Then we burn the trees using an air curtain burner designed to trap most of the smoke or we burn piles of gathered trees at times when atmospheric conditions minimize smoke spread. The park is also experimenting with burning standing dead trees under controlled conditions. 
This will break up the continuous canopy of standing fuel and reduce the risk of a high intensity wildfire. In order to protect our high value trees, we spray the trunk and limbs with an insecticide called carbaryl to prevent future infestations. Because the entire trunk has to be thoroughly coated, this isn't something we can do from the air on a mass scale. Also, carbaryl is a chemical, so we use it sparingly and avoid treating any trees near water. We're also testing the use of pheromones on some trees. The pheromones mimic the beetle's own bodily chemicals and tell them not to attack a particular tree. Although the reasons for the bark beetle outbreak are complex, most beetleologists believe that climate change or the warming of the earth due to human produced greenhouse gases is a significant factor in the size and the intensity of the outbreak. Unfortunately, other insect pests and diseases are predicted to increase with continued warming. So, you can make a personal difference by minimizing your contribution to global climate change. Every time you recycle or use less electricity in your home, or choose to ride a bike or walk instead of drive, you're helping conserve energy and keeping our planet greener. When people look at these forests and see all of the trees that the beetles have killed, sometimes they get mad or sad. But look closer. We have to see the whole forest, not just the dead trees. All throughout the stands of dead trees are patches of green, young, healthy trees that are too small to be affected by the beetles and other species of trees like aspen that aren't affected by the beetles. These youngsters are tomorrow's forest. In a few years, the needles will fall off the dead trees, allowing more light to reach the forest. That will give these younger trees a chance to grow and a whole new mix of plants will spring up on the forest floor. The dead trees will make perfect homes for different cavity nesting birds, like woodpeckers, swallows, bluebirds, and owls. As the dead trees fall into nearby streams, they will provide great hiding places and habitat for fish. The forest won't be the same as it was, but it will come back. And it will be different. It will be vibrant and new. Forests change over time. They always have. It's just nature's way of rejuvenating the land. Thanks for going behind the scenes with me today. See you on the trails. <laughs>